Section 12 of Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Rato. Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. Sand. Chapter 4 It was so simple a maneuver by which fate began the innocent game. The woman left a couple of books behind her on the table one night, and Henriot, after a moment's hesitation, took them out after her. He knew the titles, The House of the Master and The House of the Hidden Places, both singular interpretations of the pyramids that once had held his own mind spellbound. Their ideas had been since disproved, if he remembered rightly, yet the titles were a clue, a clue to that imaginative part of his mind that was so busy constructing theories and had found its stride. Loose sheets of paper, covered with notes in a minute handwriting, lay between the pages. But these, of course, he did not read, noticing only that they were written round designs of various kinds, intricate designs. He discovered Vance in a corner of the smoking lounge. The woman had disappeared. Vance thanked him politely. My aunt is so forgetful sometimes, he said, and took them with a covered eagerness that did not escape the other's observation. He folded up the sheets and put them carefully in his pocket. On one there was an ink-sketched map, crammed with detail that might well have referred to some portion of the desert. The points of the compass stood out boldly at the bottom. They were involved geometrical designs again. Henriot saw them. They exchanged, then, the common places of conversation, but these led to nothing further. Vance was nervous and betrayed impatience. He presently excused himself and left the lounge. Ten minutes later he passed through the outer hall, the woman beside him, and the pair of them, wrapped up in a cloak and ulster, went out into the night. At the door Vance turned and threw a quick investigating glance in his direction. There seemed a hint of questioning in that glance. It might almost have been a tentative invitation. But also he wanted to see if their exit had been particularly noticed, and by whom. This, briefly told, was the first maneuver by which fate introduced them. There was nothing in it. The details were so insignificant, so slight the conversation, so meager the pieces thus added to Henriot's imaginative structure. Yet they somehow built it up and made it solid. The outline in his mind began to stand foursquare. That writing, those designs, the manner of the man, their going out together, the final curious look, each and all betrayed points of a hidden thing. Subconsciously he was excavating their buried purposes. The sand was shifting. The concentration of his mind incessantly upon them removed it grain by grain and speck by speck. Tips of the smothered thing emerged. Presently a subsidence would follow with a rush a light would blaze upon his skeleton. He felt it stirring underneath his feet, this flowing movement of light, dry, heaped-up sand. It was always sand. Then other incidents of a similar kind came about, clearing the way to a natural acquaintanceship. Henriot watched the process with amusement, yet with another feeling, too, that was only a little less than anxiety. A keen observer, no detail escaped him. He saw the forces of their lives draw closer. It made him think of the devices of young people who desire to know one another, yet cannot get a proper introduction. Fate condescended to such little tricks. They wanted a third person, he began to feel. A third was necessary to some plan they had on hand, and they waited to see if he could fill the place. This woman, with whom he had yet exchanged no single word, seemed so familiar to him, well known for years. 
they weighed and watched him, wondering if he would do. None of the devices were too obviously used, but at length Henriot picked up so many forgotten articles and heard so many significant phrases casually let fall that he began to feel like the villain in a machine-made play where the hero forever drops clues his enemy is intended to discover. Introduction followed inevitably. My aunt can tell you she knows Arabic perfectly. He'd been discussing the meaning of some local name or other with a neighbor after dinner, and Vance had joined them. The neighbor moved away. These two were left standing alone, and he accepted a cigarette from the other's case. There was a rustle of skirts behind them. Here she comes, said Vance. You will let me introduce you. He did not ask for Henriot's name. He had already taken the trouble to find it out. Another little betrayal, and another clue. It was in a secluded corner of the great hall, and Henriot turned to see the woman's stately figure coming towards them across the thick carpet that deadened her footsteps. She came sailing up, her black eyes fixed upon his face, very erect, head upright, shoulders almost squared. She moved wonderfully well. There was dignity and power in her walk. She was dressed in black, and her face was like the night. He found it impossible to say what lent her this air of impressiveness and solemnity that was almost majestic. But there was this touch of darkness and of power in the way she came that made him think of some sphinx-like figure of stone, some idol motionless in all its parts but moving as a whole and gliding across sand. Beneath those level lids her eyes stared hard at him, and the faint sensation of distress stirred in him deep, deep down. Where had he seen those eyes before? He bowed as she joined them, and Vance led the way to the armchairs in a corner of the lounge. The meeting, as the talk that followed, he felt were all part of a preconceived plan. It had happened before. The woman, that is, was familiar to him, to some part of his being that had dropped stitches of old, old memory. Lady Statham. At first the name had disappointed him. So many folk wear titles as syllables in certain tongues wear accents, without them being mute, unnoticed, unpronounced. Non-entities, born to names, so often claim attention for their insignificance in this way. But this woman, had she been Jemima Jones, would have made the name distinguished and select. She was a big and somber personality. Why was it, he wondered afterwards, that for a moment something in him shrank, and that his mind, metaphorically speaking, flung up an arm in self-protection? The instinct flashed and passed, but it seemed to him born of an automatic feeling that he must protect, not himself, but the woman from the man. There was confusion in it all. Links were missing. He studied her intently. She was a woman who had none of the external feminine signals in either dress or manner, no graces, no little womanly hesitations and alarms, no daintiness, yet neither anything distinctly masculine. Her charm was strong, possessing, only he kept forgetting that he was talking to a woman. And the thing she inspired in him included, with respect and wonder, somewhere also this curious hint of dread. This instinct to protect her fled as soon as it was born, for the interest of the conversation in which she so quickly plunged him obliterated all minor emotions whatsoever. Here, for the first time, he drew close to Egypt, the Egypt he had sought so long. It was not to be explained. He felt it. Beginning with commonplaces such as, you like Egypt, you find here what you expected, she led him into better regions with, one finds here what one brings. He knew the delightful experience of talking fluently on subject he was at home in, and to someone who understood. 
the feeling at first that to this woman he could not say mere anythings slipped into its opposite, that he could say everything. Strangers ten minutes ago, they were at once in deep and intimate talk together. He found his ideas readily followed, agreed with up to a point, the point which permits discussion to start from a basis of general accord towards speculation. In the excitement of ideas, he neglected the uncomfortable note that had stirred his caution, forgot the warning, too. Her mind, moreover, seemed known to him. He was often aware of what she was going to say before he actually heard it. The current of her thoughts struck a familiar gait, and more than once he experienced vividly again the odd sensation that it had all happened before. The very sentences and phrases with which she pointed the turns of her unusual ideas were never wholly unexpected. For her ideas were decidedly unusual, in the sense that she accepted without question speculations not commonly deemed worth consideration at all, indeed not ordinarily even known. Henriot knew them because he had read in many fields. It was the strength of her belief that fascinated him. She offered no apologies. She knew. And while he talked, she listening with folded arms and her black eyes fixed upon his own, Richard Vance watched with vigilant eyes and listened, too, ceaselessly alert. Vance joined in little enough, however, gave no opinions, his attitude one of general acquiescence. Twice, when pauses of slackening interest made it possible, Henriot fancied he surprised another quality in this negative attitude. Interpreting it each time differently, he yet dismissed both interpretations with a smile. His imagination leaped so absurdly to violent conclusions. They were not tenable. Vance was neither her keeper nor was he in some fashion a detective, yet in his manner was sometimes this suggestion of the detective order. He watched with such deep attention, and he concealed it so clumsily with affectation of careless indifference. There is nothing more dangerous than that impulsive intimacy strangers sometimes adopt when an atmosphere of mutual empathy takes them by surprise for it is akin to the false frankness friends affect when telling candidly one another's faults. The mood is invariably regretted later. Henriot, however, yielded to it now with something like abandon. The pleasure of talking with this woman was so unexpected and so keen. For Lady Statham believed apparently in some Egypt of her dreams. Her interest was neither historical archaeological nor political. It was religious, yet hardly of this earth at all. The conversation turned upon the knowledge of the ancient Egyptians from an unearthly point of view, and even while she talked he was vaguely aware that it was her mind talking through his own. She drew out his ideas and made him say them, but this he was properly aware of only afterwards, that she had cleverly mercilessly pumped him of all he had ever known or read upon the subject. Moreover, what Vance watched so intently was himself, and the reactions in himself this remarkable woman produced. That also he realized later. His first impression that these two belonged to what may be called the crank order was justified by the conversation, but at least it was interesting crankiness and the belief behind it made it even fascinating. Long before the end he surprised in her a more vital form of his own attitude that anything may be true, since knowledge has never yet found final answers to any of the biggest questions. He understood from sentences dropped early in the talk that she was among those few superstitious folk who think that the old Egyptians came closer to reading the eternal riddles of the world than any others, and that their knowledge was a remnant of that ancient wisdom religion which existed in the superb dark civilization of the sunken Atlantis, lost continent that once joined Africa to Mexico. Eighty thousand years ago, the dim sands of Poseidonus, 
great island adjoining the main continent which itself had vanished a vast period before, sank down beneath the waves, and the entire known world today was descended from its survivors. Hence the significant fact that all religions and mythological systems begin with the story of a flood, some cataclysmic upheaval that destroyed the world. Egypt itself was colonized by a group of Atlantean priests who brought their curious, deep knowledge with them. They had foreseen the cataclysm. Lady Statham talked well, bringing into her great dream the strong, insistent quality of belief and fact. She knew from Plato to Donnelly all that the minds of men have ever speculated upon the gorgeous legend. The evidence for such a sunken continent, Henriot had skimmed it too in years gone by, she made bewilderingly complete. He had heard Baconians demolish Shakespeare with an array of evidence equally overwhelming. It catches the imagination, though not the mind. Yet out of her facts as she presented them grew a strange likelihood. The force of this woman's personality, and her calm and quiet way of believing all she talked about, took her listener, to some extent, further than ever before, certainly, into the great dream after her. And the dream, to say the least, was a picturesque one, laden with wonderful possibilities, for as she talked the spirit of old Egypt moved up, staring down upon him out of eyes lit at so curiously level. Hitherto all prated to him of the Arabs, their ancient faith and customs, and the splendor of the Bedouins, those princes of the desert. But what he sought, barely confessed in words even to himself, was something older far than this, and the strange dark woman brought it close. Deeps in his soul, long slumbering, awoke. He heard forgotten questions. Only in this brief way could he attempt to sum up the storm she roused in him. She carried him far beyond mere outline, however, though afterwards he recalled the details with difficulty. So much more was suggested than actually expressed. She contrived to make the general modern skepticism an evidence of cheap mentality. It was so easy, the depth it affects to conceal mere emptiness. We have tried all things, and found all wanting. The mind, as measuring instrument, merely confessed inadequate. Various shrewd judgments of this kind increased his respect, although her acceptance went so far beyond his own. And while the label of credulity refused to stick to her, her sense of imaginative wonder enabled her to escape that dreadful compromise, a man's mind and a woman's temperament. She fascinated him. The spiritual worship of the ancient Egyptians, she held, was a symbolical explanation of things generally alluded to as the secrets of life and death. Their knowledge was a remnant of the wisdom of Atlantis. Material relics, equally misunderstood, still stood today at Karnak, Stonehenge, and in the mysterious writings on buried Mexican temples and cities so significantly akin to the hieroglyphics upon the Egyptian tombs. The one misinterpreted as literally as the other, she suggested, yet both fragments of an advanced knowledge that found its grave in the sea. The wisdom of that old spiritual system has vanished from the world, only a degraded literalism left of its undecipherable language. The jewel has been lost, and the casket is filled with sand, sand, sand. How keenly her black eyes searched his own as she said it, and how oddly she made the little word resound. The syllable drew out almost into chanting. Echoes answered from the depths within him, carrying it on and on across some desert of forgotten belief. Veils of sand flew everywhere about his mind, curtains lifted, whole hills of sand went shifting into level surfaces whence gardens of dim outline emerged to meet the sunlight. 
But the sand may be removed. It was her nephew speaking almost for the first time, and the interruption had an odd effect, introducing a sharply practical element, for the tone expressed, so far as he dared express it, disapproval. It was a baited observation, an invitation to opinion. "'We are not sand-diggers, Mr. Henriot,' put in Lady Staffham before he decided to respond. "'Our object is quite another one, and I believe—I have a feeling,' she added almost questioningly, "'that you might be interested enough to help us, perhaps.' He only wondered the direct attack had not come sooner. Its bluntness hardly surprised him. He felt himself leap forward to accept it. A sudden subsidence had freed his feet. Then the warning operated suddenly for an instant. Henriot was interested. More, he was half seduced. But as yet he did not mean to be included in their purposes, whatever these might be, that shrinking dread came back a moment and was gone again before he could question it. His eyes looked full at Lady Statham. "'What is it that you know?' they asked her. "'Tell me the things we once knew together, you and I. These words are merely trifling. And why does another man now stand in my place? For the sands heaped upon my memory are shifting, and it is you who are moving them away.' His soul whispered it. His voice said quite another thing, although the words he used seemed oddly chosen. There is much in the ideas of ancient Egypt that has attracted me ever since I can remember, though I have never caught up with anything definite enough to follow. There was majesty somewhere in their conceptions, a large, calm majesty of spiritual dominion, one might call it perhaps, I am interested. Her face remained expressionless as she listened, but there was grave conviction in the eyes that held him like a spell. He saw through them into dim, faint pictures whose background was always sand. He forgot that he was speaking with a woman, a woman who half an hour ago had been a stranger to him. He followed these faded mental pictures, though he never caught them up. It was like his dream in London. Lady Statham was talking. He had not noticed the means by which she effected the abrupt transition of familiar beliefs of old Egypt, of the Ka, or double, by whose existence the survival of the soul was possible, even its return into manifested physical life of the astrology or influence of the heavenly bodies upon all sublunar activities, of terrific forms of other life, known to the ancient worship of Atlantis, great potencies that might be evoked by ritual and ceremonial, and of their lesser influence as recognized in certain lower forms, hence treated with veneration as the sacred animal branch of this dim religion and she spoke lightly of the modern learning which so glibly imagined it was the animals themselves that were looked upon as gods. The bull, the bird, the crocodile, the cat. It's there they all go so absurdly wrong, she said, taking the symbol for the power symbolized. Yet natural enough. The mind today wears blinkers, studies only the details seen directly before it. Had none of us experienced love, we should think the first lover mad. First today know the powers they knew, hence deny them. If the world were deaf, it would stand with mockery before a hearing group swayed by an orchestra, pitying both listeners and performers. It would deem our admiration of a great swinging bell mere foolish worship of form and movement. Similarly, with high powers that once expressed themselves in common forms where best they could, being themselves bodiless. The learned men classify the forms with painstaking detail, but deity has gone out of life. The powers symbolized are no longer experienced. These powers, you suggest, then, their cause, as it were, may still 
but she waved aside the interruption. They are satisfied, as the common people were, with the degraded literalism, she went on. Newt was the heavens who spread herself across the earth in the form of a woman. Shu, the vastness of space, the ibis typified Thoth, and Hathor was the patron of the western hills. Khonshu, the moon, was personified, as was the deity of the Nile. But the high priest of Ra, the sun, you notice, remained ever the great one of visions. The high priest, the great one of visions. How wonderfully again she made the sentence sing. She put splendor into it. The pictures shifted suddenly closer in his mind. He saw the grandeur of Memphis and Heliopolis rise against the stars and shake the sand of ages from their stern old temples. You think it's possible, then, to get into touch with these high powers you speak of, powers once manifested in common forms? Henriot asked the question with a degree of conviction and solemnity that surprised himself. The scenery changed about him as he listened. The spacious halls of his former cathedral palace melted into desert spaces. He smelt the open wilderness, the sand that haunted Heluan. The soft-footed Arab servants moved across the hall in their white sheets like eddies of dust the wind stirred from the Libyan dunes, and over these two strangers close beside him stole a queer, indefinite alteration. Moods and emotions, nameless as unknown stars, rose through his soul, trailing dark mists of memory from unfathomable distances. Lady Statham answered him indirectly. He found himself wishing that those steady eyes would sometimes close. Love is known only by feeling it, she said, her voice deepening a little. Behind the form you feel the person loved. The process is an evocation, pure and simple, an arduous ceremonial involving worship and devotional preparation is the means. It is a difficult ritual the only one acknowledged by the world as still effectual. Ritual is the passageway of the soul into the infinite. He might have said the words himself. The thought lay in him while she uttered it. Evocation everywhere in life was as true as assimilation. Nevertheless, he stared his companion full in the eyes with a touch of almost rude amazement. But no further questions prompted themselves or rather, he declined to ask them. He recalled, somehow uneasily, that in ceremonial the points of the compass have significance, standing for forces and activities that sleep there until invoked, and a passing light fell upon that curious midnight request in the corridor upstairs. These two were on the track of undesirable experiments, he thought. They wished to include him, too. You go at night sometimes into the desert, he heard himself saying. It was impulsive and miscalculated. His feeling that it would be wise to change the conversation resulted in giving it fresh impetus instead. We saw you there, in the Wadi Hof, put in Vance, suddenly breaking his long silence. You too sleep out then? It means, you know, the valley of fear. We wondered, it was Lady Statham's voice, and she leaned forward eagerly as she said it, then abruptly left the sentence incomplete. Henriot started. A sense of momentary acute discomfort again ran over him. The same second she continued, though obviously changing the phrase, We wondered how you spent your day there during the heat. But you paint, don't you? You draw, I mean. The commonplace question he realized in every fiber of his being meant something they deemed significant. Was it his talent for drawing that they sought to use him for? Even as he answered with a simple affirmative, he had a flash of intuition that might be fanciful, yet that might be true. That this extraordinary pair were intent upon some ceremony of evocation that should summon into actual physical expression some 
power, some type of life, known long ago to ancient worship, and that they even sought to fix its bodily outline with the pencil, his pencil. A gateway of incredible adventure opened at his feet. He balanced on the edge of knowing unutterable things. Here was a clue that might lead him towards the hidden Egypt he ever craved to know. An awful hand was beckoning. The sands were shifting. He saw the million eyes of the desert watching him from beneath the level lids of centuries. Speck by speck and grain by grain, the sand that smothered memory lifted the countless wrappings that embalmed it. And he was willing, yet afraid. Why in the world did he hesitate and shrink? Why was it that the presence of the silent, watching personality in the chair beside him kept caution still alive, with warning close behind? The pictures in his mind were gorgeously colored. It was Richard Vance who somehow streaked them through with black, a thing of darkness born of this man's unassertive presence flitted ever across the scenery, marring its grandeur with something evil, petty, dreadful. He held a horrible thought alive. His mind was thinking venal purposes. In Henriot himself, imagination had grown curiously heated, fed by what had been suggested rather than actually said. Ideas of immensity crowded his brain, yet never assumed definite shape. They were familiar, even as the strange woman was familiar. Once, long ago, he had known them well, had even practiced them beneath these bright Egyptian stars. Whence came this prodigious glad excitement in his heart, this sense of mighty powers coaxed down to influence the very details of daily life? Behind them, for all their vagueness, lay an archetypal splendor, fraught with forgotten meanings. He had always been aware of it in this mysterious land, but it had ever hitherto eluded him. It hovered everywhere. He had felt it brooding behind the towering colossi at Thebes, in the skeletons of wasted temples, in the uncouth comeliness of the Sphinx, and in the crude terror of the pyramids even. Over the whole of Egypt hung its invisible wings. These were but isolated fragments of the body that might express it, and the desert remained its cleanest, truest symbol. Sand knew it closest. Sand might even give it bodily form and outline. But while it escaped description in his mind, as equally it eluded visualization in his soul, he felt that it combined with its vastness something infinitely small as well. Of such wee particles is the giant desert born. Henriot started nervously in his chair, convicted once more of unconscionable staring, and at the same moment a group of hotel people returning from a dance passed through the hall and nodded him good night. The scent of the women reached him, and with it the sound of their voices discussing personalities just left behind. A London atmosphere came with them. He caught trivial phrases, uttered in a drawling tone, and followed by the shrill laughter of a girl. They passed upstairs discussing their little things like marionettes upon a tiny stage. But their passage brought him back to things of modern life and to some standard of familiar measurement. The pictures that his soul had gazed at so deep within, he realized, were a pictorial transfer caught incompletely from this woman's vivid mind. He had seen the desert as the gray, enormous tomb where hovered still the Ka of ancient Egypt. Sand screened her visage with the veil of centuries. But she was there, and she was living. Egypt herself had pitched a temporary camp in him, and then moved on. There was a momentary break, a sense of abruptness and dislocation, and then he became aware that Lady Statham had been speaking for some time before he caught her actual words, and that a certain change had come into her voice, as also into her manner.
End of chapter 4 of Sand